So this is the next in my series of videos examining um, fucking chair. Just examining the studio catalog of Peter Hamill. And last time I looked at his work from the 70s, right, which is the gimme decade. It's the period where everything is an undisputed classic and where I can't imagine anybody who would be interested in Hamill not loving everything he did during that time. The 80s is where it gets a little bit more complex. And my name, of course, is Hans Berger. I am the main songwriter, arranger, vocalist, etc. for Electric Brain, Electric Shadow, which is a home music project that uh, incorporates elements of progressive rock, ambient music, post-punk, etc. We're on Spotify, Bandcamp, everywhere else. Fuck. So a couple of things happened to Hamill in the 80s, and those are both, I think, uh, characteristic of any prog veterans who are still working into this decade. And one of those is a shift towards shorter and simpler songs, right? Things that can convincingly be brought across by one person with a piano or a guitar. Uh, the other is towards synthesizer-based arrangements. In Hamill's case, both of those changes are less about commercial considerations than about the need to act independently. He starts the decade by returning to a full touring band with the K group, but ultimately that gets done in by economics and uh, collapses under its own weight, right? So doing short songs, building things with drum machines and MIDI, um, that's something that allows him to bypass the forces that have, you know, kept kicking down the sandcastle of his work. But there's a learning curve that he goes through there, right? And your tolerance for his 80s work will depend, I think, on your tolerance or appreciation for synthesizers and how well you can hear what he's trying to do through the limits that are maybe sometimes imposed by the production. So, let's dig in. Filling the place with a stench of alcohol and piss! This is an album of instrumental improvisations that was made with Guy Evans, who, of course, was the drummer for Van de Graaff Generator, and as you probably know if you're watching this video, he's a fantastic, world-class drummer, a key asset to Van de Graaff, and a key asset to Hamill's solo work any time that he appears on it, which is not as often as you might hope. All that being said, this is not the most interesting album, frankly. Uh, it has some nice textures, it evokes some tense moods. Ultimately, though, it doesn't really transcend the fact of being a bunch of shit they made up on the spot. And I think in some ways, actually, it would almost have been more interesting to watch this album being made than it is to listen to the finished product, right? Um, there are some places where they're triggering samples in interesting ways, right? Um, there's a section in the song Multiman where... The kick drum and the string sound are somehow being triggered at the same time, which is interesting because it creates a tight unison effect between those two instruments that would normally be impossible to get in improv. And there are some other places where similar effects and tricks are happening. So basically, in that moment, and some other places like it, uh, Hamill and Evans are... They're using contemporary technology to blur the distinction between the percussion tracks and the melodic tracks, right? And that's cool in principle, but it's, it's more impressive in concept than it is gripping as a piece of listening. And honestly, you know, I personally have a low tolerance for improvised material, particularly coming from somebody like Hamill, who is such a stellar writer, right? particularly coming in a situation where you have someone like Evans who can really shape dynamics and play with intricate patterns. It seems to me like a wasted opportunity, maybe, to not shape some of these ideas into full songs. So this is an interesting diversion. Ultimately, it's not a major work. Filling the place with a stench of alcohol and piss! So at the time that this came out, he had just wrapped up a couple of album cycles with the K group, right? Working in a full band again. And here, he's rebounding into these very quiet, piano-based, very personal, very emotive songs. With a consistently hushed tone throughout. And I'm sure there'll be some pushback to the fact that I've rated this so low, right? Other Hamill fans might put it higher on the list one does kind of feel like an asshole for uh, criticizing something like this that seems 
so close to the heart. But I'd say that he has a lot of strengths as a writer and songwriter and texturalist and uh, soundscaper that just aren't in play here. He's an experimentalist by nature, and, you know, in this instance, that tendency is being backburnered in favor of other things that I don't think he does as well. Now, I can't deny that he's someone who absolutely has great wells of passion behind what he does. Uh, you listen to any of these albums, and you can hear a great deal of unreserved, unselfconscious feeling. But that's not necessarily the same as saying that he's always effective as a feelings-based songwriter. He is uniquely passionate, but he's not necessarily better than someone else might be at pulling off a song that's really focused on a conventional sentiment like, you know, uh, romantic frustration or fatherly love. So to me, you know, this album is admirable in its plainness and its passion, uh, but it also does less, I think, to spotlight the things that make Hamill really effective and distinctive as an artist. Now, there is one interesting thing about this album from a production standpoint, which is that he is using MIDI keyboards for most of it. Uh, but the effect that that has basically is just to remove some of the warmth and the dynamics from the sound of the final product. So you sort of have a worst of both worlds effect where we're losing the humanity of analog liveness um, but because it's all piano-based, we're not necessarily gaining any of the range of sound and instrumentation that MIDI offers. So again, many other people may find this more successful than I do, but ultimately, uh, you know, I, I can't pick this as one of his more successful albums, even from a fairly hit-and-miss decade. Filling the place with a stench of alcohol and piss! This is far and away his most 80s album, uh, in the sense that the technology, the datedness of the technology, are the most distinctive parts of the listening experience of the album. I'd almost call it Hamill's invisible touch, uh, not in terms of, you know, commercial success, but in terms of how it's relating stylistically to his other work. By which I mean it has a quality I associate with invisible touch, which is one of a kind of total rigidity and stiffness, right? Like a kind of aggressively unorganic feeling uh, that really erases a lot of dynamics and subtlety from the performance. Now, this is a very political album, right? But um, that sonic rigidity keeps the, the anger and the passion of the political content from taking off in the way that it should. But then conversely, you know, the political focus of the songs means they don't necessarily have the catchiness or the gut-level pull that uh, a lot of other 80s pop does. Now, there's still some really good stuff here. Uh, I would particularly single out the song Time to Burn, which is a wonderful dramatic ballad that I think is actually well-suited by the sounds that he's evoking. Um, but ultimately, this feels more like him learning tools that he would really later come to master. Filling the place with a stench of alcohol and piss! This is the first of two albums with a four-piece that he called the K-Group, which is, um, it was his first full band work since Vandegraaff, right? And this band is excellent, right? He got Guy Evans, who was still one of the best drummers in the world. Uh, he has John Ellis doing some wonderful textured guitar work. And it's great to see Hamill and Evans together in a guitar-based band, which Vandergraaf ultimately mostly was not. But the quality of that band, I think, comes through much more effectively on the live album The Margin, uh, which has some excellent reworkings of earlier songs, particularly material from the album Sitting Targets, which I'll talk about later in this video. The studio work with the K-Group uh, is actually surprisingly restrained in its execution to the point where, you know, to me it often feels like wasted potential. So because the band isn't really going over the top here, it really comes down to the quality of the songs, which I think on this album are, uh, on the Hamill scale, mid-tier. 
the lyrics here are tending toward very, very abstract philosophical material, really as much so as anything he's ever done. There are songs about the unconscious. There are songs about the role of chance in human life. They're conceptually interesting, but they're presented in a way that is very dry. They don't have a lot of narrative or emotional content, so, you know, they're more intellectually admirable than they are uh, thrilling per se. There's one uh, relatively long kind of epic song here that uh, it, it tries to invest um, drama and gravitas in uh, bar conversation at happy hour, right? And I think falls a bit flat in that attempt. I am uh, personally quite partial to uh, the song She Wraps It Up, which I almost never hear talked about, uh, maybe a deep cut from this album, but you know, it's a little bit more urgent in its tone than some of the others. Uh, it has kind of a new wave feel to it, almost maybe not too far from something you can imagine the police doing during this time. But it was never played live. It's not talked about a lot. It's kind of an obscure piece. Overall, this is a solid enough Hamill album, but he has done better work as a writer. And the players aren't elevating the material maybe as much as you would hope for. Filling the place with a stench of alcohol and piss! This is the second of the K Group studio albums, and it's fairly similar to the last one in terms of style and approach. What's changed here is the songs have a bit more zest and drive to them, right? A bit more of a sense of playfulness. They're a bit catchier. Uh, they tend to have characters and vignettes where inner K was maybe just more abstract. So you've got an intricate little uh, murder ballad narrative in the song Film Noir. You have a couple of epics, uh, Patient and Train Time, that I think sort of unfold maybe with more grace and tension than Happy Hour did on the last album. You have a couple of anti-love songs which express real darkness. As with the last one, I'd say this is still an album that um, it somehow doesn't quite reveal the fact that it's being played by world-class musicians who in other contexts, have really impressive interplay with each other. And I don't quite know why it doesn't reveal that, right? I guess you can admire it as uh, like a question of taste and restraint and the players serving the song rather than their egos. But this is a group that I think is actually entitled to some egotism. But uh, the advancement of the songwriting here relative to the last album, I think makes it easier to let go of those concerns the place with a stench of alcohol and piss. So just like how I put close as this lower maybe than some others would, uh, I think I may be ranking this higher than other people might. A lot of what I like about this album, I think, is how little sense it makes as an overall work, right? The way that different parts of it kind of jar against each other. Probably that's something a lot of other listeners would consider to be flaws. Now, this is a place where a lot of 80s sounds and 80s production techniques really start to come to the fore. Uh, maybe not quite so much as in a foreign town, you know, but close, right? So the arrangements are, they're still full of those kinds of synths and drum machines and like the martial, stiff 80s rhythms. Uh, but what's interesting to me is how broad the range of the songwriting is. You have Under the Skin, which has almost kind of like a David Burnish kind of spastic, jerky, neurotic quality to it, right? With this sort of body horror lyric. Uh, you have a slinky 80s ballad after the show. You have Shell, which has kind of like this bouncy British music hall quality to it. You have Four Pails, which is a show tune about atheism. So there's really a bizarrely wide range of styles. Um, they sit kind of awkwardly next to each other. Some of them maybe are more intriguing than good. Uh, but that proto-80s synth vibe ties together this really odd mix of pieces. But what really elevates it, I think, is the final song, uh, Now Lover, which is a 10-minute song, roughly, that... Um, you know, in terms of personnel and in terms of style, basically sounds like it was um, beamed in from some alternate universe where Van der Graaff Generator never broke up. And in fact, uh, it's the only song in Hamill's 80s output that I would say that about, right? That it sounds like some kind of uh, weird alternate universe Van der Graaff. You know, you have a long piece with these very kind of dynamic rises and falls, 
Uh, you have some very recognizably Guy Evans kind of rhythms. You have some very distinctly David Jackson horn squawking. But you have those in the context of the same early 80s production as the other pieces. And that piece, I think, is what tips this from being an interesting mishmash into an interesting mishmash that also has at least one piece of really powerful work, right? Like that song uh, probably moves this up two or three places in the ranking, and I think makes this a really interesting introduction to the 80s work for someone who might be a Vandergraaf fan that hasn't checked out the solo stuff. Filling the place with a stench of alcohol and piss! Now, this is an album that admittedly was released in 1990, but I've put it here because it really feels like a continuation and a culmination of the 80s work. Uh, in particular, you know, he's taking the techniques and the sounds from Skin and In a Foreign Town, but he's making something now that feels more organic and more well-rounded and where that, that synthetic texture is blended with a certain amount of very well-chosen live instrumentation. Now, a few parts don't work at all, right? Uh, sometimes the production and the arrangements still feel kind of sterile and rigid, and the material can't overcome that. But when this album works, you know, the, the singing and the writing achieve some really, some really rich moods. Um, the synthesizers are used to create some very lush, wonderful textures, and uh, those are being done in the support of some very kind of somber, catchy, but very smart songs. A couple highlights. Uh, something about Isabel's dance is a really nice bit of uh, kind of cinematic mood and scene setting that um, makes really good use of some live instrumentation. Out is probably the best job that he ever did of combining conceptual smartness with real heartfelt emotion. Green Fingers is a solid piece of pop music where that kind of 80s synth feel actually serves the song really well. No Moon in the Water uses synthesizers in this kind of orchestral way. Uh, on the surface has these, um, these, these interlocking synth loops that remind me a lot of Steve Reich. Now, the first two songs on this album are the least effective, and that may put some people off. Uh, the album overall is definitely not perfect, right? But um, I think it's a very mature synthesis of various approaches and ideas he'd been trying on the last few albums. As such, I think it's a great cap to his 80s work. Filling the place with a stench of alcohol and piss! This is another one that I think I'm putting much higher than most people would, right? Because it is an obscure part of his catalog. And it's really more like a collection of experiments than it is a cohesive album. But as a set of moods, this is amazing, right? It's as creepy and haunting and unsettling as anything he's ever done. What's effective here is he's not just making ambient textures out of the tape loops, right? Um, he's singing real songs on top of them. He's using his voice as one of the sounds in the loops. So things like uh, Ritual Mask, Mobius Loop, uh, there's a superior version here of In Slow Time from a Black Box. Those are songs that work both as textures and as interesting songs with lyrics that align conceptually with what the sonics are doing in a really interesting way. There's also one long instrumental piece that's based around a really good piano hook that's then um, gradually deconstructed. So the soundscaping here is high quality, um, but it's met with actually surprisingly good writing, given the nature of the project. There are a couple of shorter instrumental pieces that are maybe less exciting, right? But that doesn't change the fact that Overall, this is a phenomenal album, and, you know, it really deserves to be counted among his most interesting and his most exciting. You're my favorite. So this is his first album from the 80s, and in terms of the instrumentation and the production and the vocal style, uh, it actually sits fairly closely to PH7 and Black Box from the 70s, right? And... I thought a little bit about putting this on the 70s list, actually. The difference, though, is uh, he's made a conscious shift in the songwriting here, away from long-form work, away from abstraction, 
uh, towards things that you would think of as songs in a conventional sense. Things with a verse and a chorus uh, built around chord progressions that you could play on an acoustic guitar with the goal of making something that could be uh, rearranged and adapted into other settings. And it succeeded. Uh, you know, the songs on this album have been played and reworked over and over throughout his career. And I do think that they deserve that, right? The writing here consistently balances catchiness and mystery and intelligence and emotion. Uh, and you can't imagine anybody else writing any of these songs. But... Uh, even though some of the reputation of these songs might come from being adapted by the K group and by his later work in the noise and, and you know, solo acoustic performances, I think it's also true that these specific versions are great. Um, you know, like I said when I was talking about the 70s work, there's something about the vibe of these early homebrew albums that is totally unique, right? Some, some specific... Uh, creepy and haunting and timeless mood. And this is the last thing he did with that mood. So you have this balance of some of his best songwriting with that particular vibe. Uh, and that balance makes this not just a set of great songs, but a great freestanding piece and one of the best of his career. So that's Hamill's work in the 80s. Uh, do you agree with this ranking? Do you have thoughts or perspectives I might have missed? Um, if so, feel free to put them in the comments, uh, like and subscribe. And as always, check out Electric Brain, Electric Shadow on Bandcamp, Spotify, wherever else you get your music. <laughs>